Hello and welcome to episode 63 of the Synergen Leadership Podcast. For those of you who are listening for the first time, my name is Julian Carl and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Synergen Group. I'm passionate about all things leadership and management. So passionate, in fact, that I decided to start a podcast about it and here we are in season three. My purpose for the podcast continues to be the same, to raise the standard of leadership. In today's show, I speak with Dr. Karen Morley, who is the author of Lead Like a Coach, How to Get the Most Out of Any Team. As an expert in coaching, collaboration, and connected leadership, Karen's work focuses on the areas of leadership identity, transition and transformation, leadership styles, inclusive leadership, gender equity, and unconscious bias. She works at individual, team, and organizational levels with a purpose being to reset leadership. Typically, she works with clients who are CEOs and executives teams to develop organizational capability and work better together. She also works with individual executives to increase leadership capability, build presence, step up, increase engagement, and be more balanced. Karen is particularly motivated to work on eliminating barriers to potential. These might be barriers that individuals place on themselves, that organizations place on how they choose leaders, or that society places on those who can be a leader. Her vision is to reset leaders so they are energized, amplified, and connected, and this enables them to reset leadership so that it mobilizes action unites effort and creates value. Now, during the course of the conversation, we explore Karen's book in detail. I start off by asking Karen, why did she decide to write this book? We speak about how coaching realizes potential and the four main forms of mind. We explore the idea of a coaching presence and the elements that make up that coaching presence. And I finish the interview by asking Karen about how do we go about creating a coaching culture? So keep listening, and as always, we'd really like to hear your thoughts about the interview with Dr. Karen Morley, author of Lead Like a Coach, How to Get the Most Out of Any Team. Happy listening. Welcome to the Synergen Leadership Podcast with Julian Carl. Julian returns in 2019 with weekly conversations with leaders and authors from Australia and around the world, giving you the opportunity to share in their journey and learn from their expertise and knowledge. Julian also shares some of the tools and techniques he uses as a leader, mentor, and facilitator, helping you to build your leadership capability and improve your confidence as a leader. Welcome, Karen, to the Synergen Leadership Podcast. Really appreciate you taking the time to be a part of it so that the listeners have a bit of an idea about who you are. Who is Karen Molly? Thanks very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Essentially, I'm a leadership coach. Uh, I've spent all of my career working in the leadership development area. I've had leadership roles as well, so I've had great opportunities to um, to experience leading and understand what it's really like, and I think that's an important part of uh, my approach to coaching. And I've been so curious about leadership that apart from writing a book, I also did um, my PhD because I'm just so curious about what good leadership is and how you do it. So we're here today to talk about your book, Lead Like a Coach, How to Get the Most Out of Any Team. Why did you decide to take all your experience and go through the process of writing a book? Yes, uh, good question. One reason for it is that because I am so passionate about people coaching, leaders coaching, not just me coaching, um, that what I wanted to do was to share processes and practices around coaching so that leaders could pick them up and use them themselves. I mean, when I go in and coach people in an organisation, that's time limited. And then what happens after that? So it's really about providing some guidance to leaders who are interested in improving the way they lead um, so that they can take this and use it. And it's written very much as a practical guide. And I think the other thing about writing the book, and I do quite like to write, but writing the book means that I process my thinking and I get some clarity about you know some of the processes that really do work and um, can streamline those and think about those how-to activities so it was a discipline to get clearer about you know my approach and what works as I was reading the the, the, the book there was a, a bit that I'd uh, I think uh, I really want to share with the listeners and it's, it's, a, it's a quick little excerpt The core proposition of this book is that leading like a coach will help you lighten the burden you feel and give you more energy. 
By refocusing the way you engage with your team members, you can double their engagement and get more and better work done. This book is for leaders who care about the people they lead, care about their own success, and want to make a positive impact on their stakeholders, their families, and their communities. It'd be pretty weird, I think, if uh, that didn't resonate with uh, just about everyone who reads the book, I think, Karen? Yes, that is very much the case. One of the big issues with uh, most of the leaders that I speak with, and again, those that I coach, is the pressure that they feel under. And what that means is that they have a sense that they're not being the leader that they want to be. You know, they, they want to be good at leading and at their job, but because of the, the workload pressures, they don't always get the chance to be their best selves. Um, and so that makes people feel incongruent. So I think that if there is any opportunity to shift that so that people can lead in the way that they want to lead by being caring leaders and supportive leaders for their people as well at the same time as focusing on their um, outcomes and goals um, then I think that I'll feel very proud about the uh, the value of the book. I want to start digging deep into the book I think one of the questions I ask and you, you talk about this is you suggest that uh, people and leaders and organizations really need to develop a coaching culture. So why is that? Mm. A lot of organizations actually want a coaching culture. They want uh, a lot more coaching from their leaders because I think that people get the proposition that if you coach, that develops people, you get more skills, more capability, um, and that makes really good sense. But I think, again, because of the pressures, that doesn't always happen. And also that organisations tend to put a priority in the moment on the results. And because there is constant pressure around results these days in organisations, that opportunity to coach seems to get left out and left behind. We continue to place the emphasis on results um, in the moment. Yeah, I think that a lot of businesses are very much, uh, you know, finding it a challenge now to get the results, even though they recognise that the coaching culture is, is the way forward. A lot of them just aren't, aren't able to see how it translates into getting those results, even though there's pl- plenty of evidence to suggest the other. Yeah, that, that's right. And, and that connection uh, between leadership coaching and engagement is very strong and I think that leaders in organisations, senior leaders uh, get that Um, but I think the pressures from boards and in government, the pressures um, on public sector leaders uh, just mean that they're they're just too frantic uh, to spend the time coaching. It's seen as I guess taking up too much time which I don't think it needs to do. So why are organisations better places when they have a coaching sort of leadership in place? I think they're better because they're focused on support, encouragement and growth. Um, And when leaders are coaching, instead of answering the questions or instead of telling people what to do, they're they're allowing their team members to identify their own options, to identify their own solutions, to to have a try at um, things, even if they don't necessarily uh, know all of the answer or they don't necessarily have the full skills to do things, they're at least starting they're having a go and that's really encouraging when people feel you know encouraged it gives them the dopamine hit they feel rewarded and they'll they'll put more effort in so I think that when when leaders are able to do that give people more opportunity they grow they can do better work um, they can get more done and then leaders themselves don't need to do as much work and feel so responsible for all of the outcomes and I think when leaders coach Um, they delegate more. So that naturally means that there's less of the responsibility for doing work left with them um, and there's more that's that's spread to to their teams. One of the things I really liked about the the book was that throughout the book you've you've got a bit of data to to, to back up some of your perspectives and one of the ones which uh, I think is really worthwhile exploring is the idea that less than a third of the workforce is engaged and about one quarter is actively disengaged. And I, and I think you're suggesting that coaching can help to uh, address those, those pretty scary stats. 
Yeah, they they are scary. Um, And I think that, uh, you know, some people are partly engaged, but they're not fully engaged. Um, What we want is people who are enthusiastic and they're motivated, they come in the door um, to work and and they want to give their their full. Um, And the fact that so few organisations are are getting that from their workforce is really concerning. And, And I particularly wanted to highlight that um, in the book, I think when organisations see that data and they see their own engagement results, you know, there are, there are concerns about what's going on, what's happening. And I do think that coaching can really shift that. Um, it, through coaching, as I've, I've already said, people feel much more empowered to work. They feel much more motivated because they're creating the solutions. They're identifying how to do things. You know, that, that is so motivating. Um, it gives people the opportunity to grow and develop and it, it's so much more sustaining. So those sorts of practices are very clearly uh, through research shown to, to produce those outcomes. So again, we go back to that coaching culture and why that might be important, uh, I guess we can still keep asking the question and pushing the challenge to leaders that we really need to be shifting the kinds of behaviours that are most, you know, common in organisations. You talk in the book about the contagion effect. Do you able to share with the listeners uh, what that is and how it, how, how it impacts a business? Yeah, um, I think that holding work to yourself and owning your own work and wanting to be responsible for solutions and outcomes and if you're ambitious or have a a focus on on results yourself you tend to keep that work to yourself and that's contagious i mean i think we've got that contagion right now in a lot of organizations but the contagion of coaching is is a bit different so once somebody starts to coach someone else what they're role modeling to them is that you don't have to know everything. You can form nice human connections with the people that you work with. You can ask questions instead of telling people what to do. And again, you create all of those very positive, you know, neurochemicals that make people feel good. If people feel good, they'll feel more motivated and then they're they're going to engage. And so you're role modeling how people should interact in organizations that it doesn't have to be all about you tell and I do it can be about you ask and I find the solution um, and then I can put that into place in my way and in those organizations that I've uh, worked with as well as the the research that I've looked at when leaders do that Uh, their team members do feel much more empowered to do the same kinds of things either with the people who report to them or with their peers around them. Um, And I use a a case study in the book around Jackie, who happens to be in what must be an absolutely fabulous organisation where people are focused on being deliberately developmental and that's the culture that they want to create in that organisation. And in that particular organisation, she was held to account for not coaching. She was controlling too much and too concerned about, um, I guess, wanting to be seen to be successful, which is a good thing. We want leaders to be successful and it's important that they see themselves as successful. But she was taking too much of the responsibility for herself. And when her own leader was able to coach her to demonstrate what that was like and what the difference was, um, you know, she was able to get that and learn some of the skills by being coached. And she found that when she changed her style and engaged in a more coaching style with her team, then the relationships with the team members uh, grew. They were much more positive. People wanted to engage with her instead of perhaps wanting to avoid with her and, and, and they weren't giving the feedback anymore that she was focused on herself. So I think that coaching, you know, reduces the power distance between leaders and their people um, and it means that people get more appreciation and recognition for the work that they do as well. One of the things which when uh, I'm delivering leadership programs that I always encourage people to 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 do and to think about is is their potential. I often say to them that I, I believe more in them than they often believe in themselves and one of the things which really resonated with me in your book 
Karen, was this idea that coaching realizes potential. Are you able to explain why that is? Yeah, yeah. And I mean, it's something that has been a core focus for me as well through um, the work that I've been doing on leadership development and and why coaching um, is something that I see um, as really positive. I think that uh, coaching is very much focused on the future. Uh, It's much more creative. It's about focusing on what's possible. In coaching, you're identifying identifying a lot of different options and those options are around uh, growth. Um, And I think that's very different from a traditional management or a controlling focus, um, which is more about let's get things right, let's focus on what's in the here and now. Um, And so that's really not very inspiring for people. Um, And it can be quite constraining um, as well. So the difference around coaching, because it's focused on the future, because it's supportive, because it's it's not constraining um, how you might approach things, um, it's not constraining somebody's own style, then um, that is allowing them the space to develop their potential. I think one of the the big um, concerns about controlling uh, cultures, which I'm very much against, is that they really do shut down people um, and their capability and their potential for growth into the future. And as organisations now uh, are needing to be adaptive and flexible and innovative, um, things are changing so rapidly, we really need everyone in the organisation able to think for themselves, able to come up with different options to be trusted, um, to, to take up challenges and move forward with those and to contribute to the way the organisation's responding to the change. Um, and coaching, I think, is absolutely perfect for that whereas controlling just doesn't set organisations or people up for for those future possibilities. I'm personally a bit of a, a frameworks and models uh, junkie, I suppose you could call for a, for a better phrase. I, when I come across a framework or a model in a book, I'm always right on it. And there was one here that I found particularly interesting, which you call the four main forms of mind. Yes. I'm like wondering if you could uh, talk a little bit about that. Now, this comes from Jennifer Garvey-Berger, and it's similar to uh, work to that done by other people. But basically, what I think is really exciting about this approach is that um, it says that adults can develop. Um, And I think we tend to see adults as pretty much fully formed, and by the time they're uh, middle to senior leaders in organisations, we think they're pretty much set. Um, But what I think is really exciting is this idea that adults can continue to to grow and to even transform, uh, to create um, bigger and more powerful identities and leadership identities as they go through their careers. Um, And so this is what the four forms of mind um, are all about. They're very much about uh, moving from being authorised by others, you know, through family messages we've had or previous leaders and their styles or our current boss or authority figures um, around us. And what we're moving towards is being able to self-authorise. And part of that is being able to take a number of different perspectives. So, when we're, I guess, less developed as adults, we tend to see there's one fixed way um, of seeing things and we tend to take that from others. So if the boss says this, the person in authority with the status says this is the way to do things, then that's how we'll do them. Once people get into more senior leadership roles, that really doesn't serve them very well. They really need to be able to step into the authority um, of the role that they're in and to take it on for themselves um, and to self-authorise. Uh, and so this is one of the models that I use in coaching um, quite a lot so that people feel less uh, less bounded by others um, and are able to have much stronger, fuller confidence in the decisions that they're making about strategy and the decisions that they're making about their teams and financial decisions, etc. And when you introduce people to that, that model in, in your sessions, how, how do they respond? Mostly 
They love it. In fact, I, I met with a new coaching client just last week and he was feeling very stuck. Um, he's had some feedback that's pretty challenging about being quite a controlling leader um, and he's not doing that well in terms of the relationships he has with his peers. He understands that he needs to change. He's come from a very different um, organisation, a different industry, very different culture. So he's now been sort of six months into this new role. Everything's changed. He's not quite sure how to be. He knows that he needs to be different. Um, so when I talk to him about um, these ideas of authorization and having multiple perspectives and even just the fact that adults can develop, it's possible to move from being stuck to being unstuck to develop for yourself a new identity as a leader, there was a sense of relief. Um, and I, I talk with leaders about this development, meaning that um, they, they're able to become bigger people. It's not that who they are now is not um, sufficient, but they need to ask the question about how well it serves them and what they can do in their development is basically they become bigger people. They can take on um, a new sense of their own identity as a leader, which makes leading at um, more senior levels in organisations easier, you know, relieve some of the pressure, the responsibility um, of having so many resources and so many people under your control. So even if people aren't experiencing that same uh, stuckness um, that that uh, person last week was, uh, it's still that idea of how do I sort of free myself up at more senior levels to be the leader I want to be and not feel pushed and shoved from one meeting to the next and one demand for the next and try to meet the needs of so many people around me um, by being able to take a different perspectives, by being able to self-authorise and, and, you know, develop their own style of leading, um, the job becomes much easier. There's a big sense of relief. I imagine it must be very rewarding when they uh, come to that realisation. It is indeed. Um, oh, I really love coaching. Um, and I guess uh, that's another reason for writing the book. Um, and I think that, you know, the coaching process just does release all of those great, you know, neurochemicals like oxytocin and, and dopamine. And I get that experience when I coach. Um, and that gives me a great sense of energy. Um, and again, when leaders are able to do that and to make that a, a bigger part of their repertoire, then leading can be much more enjoyable. I was fascinated with this idea and probably because uh, we're synergens of training companies, you talk about, the four elements of the learning cycle. Mm -hmm. And I'd like you to, if you can, explain how that relates to the other thing which really fascinated me was this idea of a scoreboard because I do, I do like my numbers. So are you <laughs> able to share with the listeners how those two work together? Yeah. Uh, so the, um, the learning reflection cycle um, is really designed to help uh, leaders think about um, some different ways to take in information and to cement the value of reflection and observation, which leaders find very little time to do. Um, most leaders don't take the time, don't feel that they have the time to reflect. It sounds like it's going to take um, a lot of time because the, the book is designed as a how-to and there are a lot of activities in it um, and it is about helping leaders to, if you like, teach themselves to coach. What I wanted to do was to emphasise that they would be able to um, increase their learning to learn uh, more quickly if they were to add observation and reflection into to what they're doing. And one of the reasons for the scoreboard um, is to, to add in that focus around um, self-assessment um, and understanding their current capability um, and what they want to focus on to build that into the reflection that they do. That way, they can really identify the sense of progress that they're making. Number one, they've got clarity about what it is they want to change. Two, they've got the regular uh, 
um, reflection so that they're taking stock of how they're changing um, and, you know, noticing how they're changing. And then the scoreboard means that what they can do is they can tick through the various boxes and say, yes, now I understand more about how you go about coaching. Now I understand when to coach. I've tried a few different ways to coach and this is what happened when I did. Um, and so through that sort of self-assessment, self-reflection process, um, I, I think that the evidence, and as a psychologist, I would say that that really helps to embed learning. One of the, the things that I've noticed that's coming up in a lot of the conversations I'm having, both as part of this podcast and also just my general conversations with people in my community is this idea of presence. So there's a real suggestion that leaders need to develop an executive presence or a leadership presence. And in chapter four, you talk about this idea of a coaching presence. Can you share a little with the listeners about, you know, what, how they do that? Part of the reason for focusing on the coaching presence idea is that um, there needs to be a mindset shift from the day to day, you know, a stream of activities to coaching someone. There's a different pace to a coaching conversation. There's a different style to the coaching conversation. Um, and so as I was putting um, the book together and thinking about um, how I coach and how I prepare myself for a coaching conversation and what seems to work best, it, it seemed to me that it uh, was really helpful to talk about how you prepare your mind before you coach and how you can be in the coaching conversation to really highlight how different it is. Um, and I use this model with a lot of leaders. And sometimes I think, you know, I'm talking about vulnerability and empathy, humility and appreciation. And I think, you know, these leaders are going to say, well, that's all the soft and fluffy stuff. And I've been really blown away by how engaged people become in the conversation about coaching presence and how interested they are and how ready they are to, uh, to assess themselves, to explore, you know, what does it mean to be vulnerable when you're a leader? It's a very good question. And people are a bit concerned about what that might mean. So the, the coaching presence model opens up a lot of really interesting conversations. And as I said, I've been really interested and encouraged by people's um, interest in that model and interested interest in exploring what it means for them. Um, and I think, the presence word and and we have been talking about executive presence for a while that's been a big thing so I think that probably helps I don't have to if you like sell the idea of presence itself but the idea of coaching presence is a bit new and people are quite curious about it do you think people are that you're, you're speaking to a very accepting of it because they realize that the you know the old style command and control type leadership is no longer working and that things are changing so fast that they, they, they need to think about what they're going to do and how they're going to change? Yes, I, th I think so. And I think also when I think oh, just yesterday I was in a workshop doing this with um, uh, quite a large group of people and I, I think it's, I think they know what and I think organisations are talking um, about coaching as being important as we've already um, discussed. I just think for a lot of people it's the how. You know, I get the what and I understand the why. Uh, we're going to you know, get a different culture. Coaching is a way to do that. But I don't really know how. Even though a lot of organisations have done coaching training, I think sometimes it's a little bit perhaps mechanistic. Um, so I, I think it, it's more how. Um, and leaders, I think, are then, you know, they're able to note, okay, this is, this is something else I can focus on. I can focus on, you know, asking questions more, being more curious. That's something I can do. So I think that's the other part of it, actually. When, when they look at this model and we think about coaching presence and a different mindset, okay, I can focus on being vulnerable. This is how I can do it. I, I need to be more em empathic. Oh, I know what that means. Okay, I need to do that more often. So I think it's very much the how guidance that leaders uh, are looking for so that they can turn the intentions they have and the understanding of what they need to do into some practical action. 
I'm imagining there's probably leaders around who, you know, for, for whatever reason may not believe that they are the right person to coach someone else. Maybe they, they, they don't have belief in themselves in that respect. And you talk about the idea that, you know, people need to believe in their power to coach. How do we, how do we start to get people to view themselves as, as a potential coach moving into being a coach? Yeah, and, and I think this is probably the biggest challenge when it comes to individual leaders uh, moving to more of a coaching style. I mean, in organisations, people get to be leaders because they've been fantastic individual contributors or professionals. They've been really good. You know, you do good work and therefore you get promoted and all of a sudden you're managing people and then you might get promoted up another level or two. And I think that organisations are not necessarily so great at helping people to understand the difference between being an individual contributor um, and being a leader. And one of the biggest challenges in that is that people really need to see themselves less as the individual contributor. They need to develop that new sense of identity for themselves as a leader. Uh, That means they have to let go of um, some of their expertise and and that i think is the is the really big challenge what am i going to be good at now is it just leadership but you know <laughs> what does that mean is that enough and i think that that provokes a degree of anxiety for people as they move into those more more senior roles what are my projects what are the things that i'm doing rather than thinking about the best thing that a leader particularly one who's managing a group of managers who are then managing their staff is the best thing they can do is to help them be good leaders of their people um, and that way they'll get the best result. So I think there's still a lot of anxiety about that and that's partly organisations expect leaders even at very senior levels to, to know the details of things that are happening um, in their part of the business all the time. So there's often a drive to be able to come up with quite specific answers immediately. Now, that might be important when you're dealing with certain kinds of crises or if you're in emergency services, you might need to know exactly what's happening down on the ground. But most of the time, that's not the case. But leaders, I think, get get sucked into that. Now, I've got to ask the question that um, popped out at me and comes from page 88 and it's always a... It's always a challenge and the the listeners will understand why because I've written a book all about mentoring. And so whenever I come across people that talk about mentoring and coaching, Karen, I've I've got to ask a question and you actually include managing and consulting in your your, your sort of framework. So uh, what are your views on the differences between mentoring, coaching, managing and consulting? Yeah, so my view on the the differences doesn't mean that that's how the world necessarily sees it. I I think that one of the challenges, which I I think is what you're alluding to, is that people mix those things up. So it's not always particularly particularly clear. But the distinction that I make um, and that I include managing as well as um, consulting is in two different arenas and one is in um, the power differential between the person who's being coached or mentored and the person doing the coaching or mentoring and then the other distinction is the focus that's taken to the relationship and the conversations Um, and one focus is on solutions and the other is on development. So managers um, generally are working off a higher power differential and their focus is on solutions. Let's Let's get things done. Whereas mentoring, I think there is a larger power distance between the person being mentored and the mentor. And that's based on the experience that the mentor brings. So usually the experience is a senior uh, leader who's had experience in the area that that the person is being mentored in. And so they're a guide to what to do and how to do it. The focus is on development, but there is that power relationship still. 
consulting, I think, in fact, I think um, a lot of mentoring and coaching is kind of consulting, to be honest. Um, so I think that consulting, there is a lower lower power differential and the focus is on solutions. So as a consultant, I can come in, you're asking me to tell you the solution, I'll give you the solutions I think work, and then you make a choice about whether or not you'll act on those solutions. In coaching, also a low, low power differential and the focus is on development. So as a coach, I come in in service to the person being coached. The, the goals that we uh, focus the coaching program um, around are the goals that the person brings in often, you know, in conjunction with what the organisation is wanting. And so it's less directive in a sense, um, but the direction is very much about development. So that's my take on it. I'll be interested in understanding yours, Julian. <laughs> I knew you were going to ask that question. <laughs> I, I think for me, I, I, in all honesty, I haven't given a lot of thought to the management uh, consulting piece. I tend to think of management as more internal, consulting more external in terms of an organisation. But I have given a fair bit of thought to the mentoring, coaching relationship. And I suppose the distinction that I've come to, and I, and I think you're right, that a lot of people either use the words uh, that they're intertwined or that people have a lot of different interpretations of it. For me, I tend to look at coaching as a little more specific, that I'm, I might be coaching someone in something uh, specific, whether it be, you know, how to have a difficult conversation or, you know, how, how to, you know, sell something or what it might be. Mentoring, from my perspective, is probably a bit more ambiguous. It's probably a bit a bit less specific. And, again, it's like you said, it, it's leveraging off the mentor's experience. And I think that's, that's a, they're the distinctions I make between the two. And in fact, I've included the managing and consulting um, here because, uh, you know, the, the book is designed for, you know, managers, leaders in organisations. So I particularly wanted to highlight that distinction between, if you like, the, the management you know, as, as usual compared with um, coaching. I think there are a lot of different ways to, to see these things and, and provided that there's a clarity about the contract that you have between the person you're mentoring or coaching or consulting or managing, then you've got fit for purpose. Yeah, and I, and I think from a, a personal level, I think that's actually uh, happened to me in that I, I, I put out a, a scholarship every now and then for people to be mentored by me and I started that relationship with someone and very quickly as a result, it became apparent to me that the idea needed to shift. So in my view, it's almost, she's no longer a mentee. She's actually almost an apprentice because she wants to do exactly what I do and we're working towards getting her to that goal. So I think you're right. It needs to be clear about what the basis of the relationship is. Hmm. And then you can call it anything you like so, so long as you both agree on, on what its purpose is. So I liked this idea of cognitive flexibility. I think that's becoming a lot more relevant thanks to the, I think it's the World Economic Forum's report about skills needed in 2020. So how does coaching require cognitive flexibility? If a leader is going to coach, then they need to get out of their own way of thinking so that they can understand the person that they're coaching. If they can't do that then I don't think they can coach because coaching is about helping the other person to identify their goals to see things in different ways so that's one way that it's particularly important but I also think that from a developmental point of view that cognitive flexibility helps you to identify different options so it helps you to create different kinds of futures different kinds of actions um, instead of feeling like there's one way to do things, which means that you're going to be you know, pretty rigid or fixed or end up getting stuck. There are a number of different ways to, to go about it. And I think that, and I've given an, an example of someone um, that I was coaching 
who did feel really um, stuck where she was um, and the cognitive flexibility piece in our conversation, she kept thinking about where she was now, where she wanted to go to. And what I did was to suggest that she think about herself in the future where she was and then think back to the present. Very simple thing to do but taking her mind and shifting the way she was seeing things out to the future and looking back, you know, just developed this aha moment for her. So she was able to look at the same situation that she was in from a very different perspective, identified some new options and, and also discovered some new energy for those options. So there's some um, good realisation going on. Part of the coaching piece. Um, If we're thinking as I am about coaching being quite generative, it's about the future, it's about somebody's future development and it's also about allowing them to take more control of their own development. So, you know, they're kind of self-generating. Then I think the ability to take, you know, different perspectives to be quite flexible in in thinking um, is fundamental for being able to do that. Do you think that a lot of coaches do that well. I mean, I, I think of some of the some of the people that I've come across in in my business career who suggest to me that they are coaches. But then I, I I have some level of conversation with them, and it leaves me wondering if they are open to. And I think you put it really well when you talk about shaping new perspectives by creating distinctions. I I sometimes wonder if that's a skill that every coach that I've come in contact with actually has. Yeah. Yeah. Look, I, I would very much agree with you. I think that uh, there are very low barriers to entry to the coaching game. And I think that people come into coaching uh, from a, a variety of different um, career paths, which means that they've had, I guess, different experiences of being coached, but also um, they have different views on what it means to be a coach. Um, and I think because I have got a strong um, social psychology background and that's very much how I uh, see myself um, as a coach and they're the sort of theories that I rely on a lot to think about change and and development. Uh, I think that that's fundamental. That growth is quite fundamental. Um, I think that what some coaches who are perhaps less experienced in coaching and in development are doing is using the same frameworks that they've got. So they might have a few frameworks um, for how to coach or how to be a leader and the coaching process is about transmitting those and handing those over to the person being coached. Um, So I see that as being a bit more about one-to-one training and I I wouldn't necessarily characterize that as coaching either I think the flexibility of thinking is fundamental to development and that's fundamental to what coaching is yep absolutely have to agree I was interested when you start giving people some real real starting points and, and and you do that in the form of the four coaching basics and I was wondering if you were able just to sort of quickly run through those at a high level because I do want to dig deeper into the first one. Right. That's very good. Um, Creating psychological safety is the first one um, and absolutely fundamental to good relationships, one-on-one between leaders and people, but also in work groups. Um, Once you've got psychological safety, it's possible to develop rapport. I think that rapport helps you to be in sync with the coachee and that that's really powerful when you are there for someone um, and, you know, you've developed that rhythm of working together, then that really accelerates the whole coaching process. Active listening seems pretty basic, uh, but I think that Probably most leaders understand how to do active listening well, but don't necessarily take the time uh, to do it. And asking open questions is a real art. Open questions really expand the conversation. They open up those options and, and allow the cognitive thinking and flexibility to come to the, to the fore. So they're the four coaching basics. All right. So the one I want to dig into is, is 
uh, psychological safety. And I, I want to do it because I've been doing some work around psychological safety for a little while now, and it always gets uh, a pretty good response when you start talking about, you know, the value of, of having that and why it leads to higher performance. The thing I really liked about what you wrote in here is these five key points that uh, you need to address to make someone feel psychologically safe. And I thought that if, if nothing else, people just take that, that, those five points, that's going to have a huge impact on the way their team performs, on the quality of the relationship. So I was wondering if you're able to, to go through the five points for the listeners because I think this is, this is super valuable. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, and I, I, I think it's super valuable too. I think it's also pretty um, simple and that we all understand these um, human needs. So the first is um, that I matter. You know, you, you can see me in a sense that um, I am here as, as part of the group. And the second is um, a sense of belonging. That's such a fundamental need. You know, we we are such social creatures. Um, we want to feel like we're part of the group or part of the team and making people feel welcome and that they are a part of the group is really important. Um, feeling enabled. Um, and so it's not enough just to be here, uh, to be in the team, to be part of it. I need to have the resources and to be equipped so that I can actually contribute to the team. So that's things like, you know, clarity of what my role is, the tools to do my job well. The fourth is a sense of contribution. When I talk with people, and I'm sure it's the same for you, everybody wants to make a difference. When you talk about what's your aspiration, um, what's your future aspiration, it is to make a difference in some way, shape or form. Um, the, the focus for the difference might vary from person to person, but um, in the team, I want to have a sense of I, that, that I contribute and that what I do and what I bring actually makes a difference to our work. And then finally, I want to be respected uh, so that you're recognising me for the person that I am what I contribute and how I contribute. I think they're, they are a very powerful needs that we have. I think the leaders who, you know, simplify what they're doing and bring it down to um, meeting these needs, you know, do really great jobs with their people. I'm seeing a real, a real application here uh, personally because I've recently joined a board of, of another business and, you know, just being exposed to, to that board has really made me think, okay, here, here, here's something I can take to that board quite quickly and hopefully they can start to embrace those key points because my observation is that uh, right now they may not be. So thank you from a very personal perspective for those five <laughs> points. Oh, that's a pleasure. I'm glad that it's useful for you. So We've still got work to do on it. Um, oh, it yeah. It's not always as easy as it needs to be as, as your experience shows. So I really like this idea of creating coaching moments. And I think, I think I, I like that idea because quite often people think that, you know, oh, my coaching session's at two o'clock today and anything that happens between now and my, then and my next coaching session, I, I don't have. So I really like this idea of coaching moments. So how can leaders go about creating those coaching moments? I think there are a number of ways that they um, can do it. And, and I think if we take as pretty much a given that the fact that people don't have enough time to do all of the things that, that they want to do in the day and they don't necessarily have enough time or make the time to sit down and do a, a full coaching conversation, then they can, you know, seize the moment when they're walking between meetings um, and, and give a coaching style to the conversation. They can um, ask people how they're going, what are they learning, what are the challenges that they're experiencing. If somebody asks uh, the leader a question instead of simply providing the answer, what they can do is ask a question back. Um, how would you go about it? So um, I think that one of the things that I talk about is leaders priming themselves at the beginning of the day. So if you want to be 
a coach and it's a struggle to fit it into the day and to fit it into what you're already doing, if at the beginning of the day you prime yourself to think about how you might include some coaching moments, then you're much more likely to do some coaching during the day. You know, if you've got a half hour meeting uh, with a, a team member, maybe make the first five to 10 minutes about the questioning rather than focusing just on the tasks that need to be done. Um, asking for feedback um, and um, again, you know, just seizing any moments, the water cooler moments, moments in passing to ask a question um, rather than, uh, you know, simply giving an instruction or, or, I don't know, talking about the weather. I think there are lots of little moments in days that, that can be used for coaching. I really like that you gave people a game plan for want of a better phrase and you talk about the coaching circle and I think that you know I think the reason I personally like frameworks and especially the fact you've made it visual I think really uh, provides people with a better way to understand it so you're able to to share what the coaching circle is. Hmm. And you mentioned uh, earlier on the idea of the GROW model. Um, and this model is not dissimilar from, from that model. Um, it, it, uh, it just slightly different. But the first part of the coaching circle conversation focuses on relationship and, and creating relationship with the coachee. And, and that is the longest and the most important part um, of the circle. Um, and even the, the circle um, imagery is very important too because you know humans have tended to, to congregate in circles and circles are very much about lateral connections rather than hierarchical connections um, and it's a bit about also that circular flow even though I'm suggesting there's a place to start in, in any particular coaching conversation over time it might not happen necessarily in that way and a good cycle um, is set up. So focusing first on um, relationship and understanding what it is that's going on for the person and then the second stage, which is the second longest, um, is focused on possibility. So once you understand, you know, someone's needs and interests and what's going on for them, you can start to generate options and possibilities. And I know in one organisation, the coaching focus that they've taken when it comes to options is not just to generate a few or even many, but not to stop this part of the, the cycle until you've absolutely exhausted every single option that you can. And that's so they're deliberately building in the um, innovation and creativity into the, the coaching process. The, the third step in the process is uh, action. So this is the part of the process that managers usually feel most comfortable with. It's the, okay, we've come up with a lot of options, but which one or two are we going to focus on? What needs to happen? Who needs to do it by when? The action planning stage. And the final part of the circle is debriefing the learning. So that's about saying, what have we learned by having this coaching conversation? It's an opportunity for the coach, the leader, to get feedback on what happened. And they might actually do this part of the process at the time, or they might come back a bit later to get the reflections of the person that they've coached. I think this part of the cycle, it's its important to think about how comfortable the coachee is giving feedback to you as the coach. Um, if you're just starting out coaching and, and there's still, you know, a fair bit of sort of power distance in the relationship, it might take a while to get this going. Um, but over time, I think the opportunity for someone to give feedback to their uh, leader on, how did this coaching conversation work for me? Uh, what was it that you did that really helped me? What else would I like in the future? I think is a really powerful thing to do. I was fascinated with a term which you talk about called feed forward. And I think a lot of people may not be familiar with, with that idea. So are you able to share what the feed forward process is? Yes. Um, and this is a, a feedback process, if you like, that takes a lot of the sting out of feedback. 
many people are quite aversive when it comes to feedback. They've had negative experiences or they think that, you know, if you don't hear what's going on, everything is okay. But feedback should really be about, you know, improvement and about the future. So I think that Marshall Goldsmith, who coined this term and this process, is really onto something um, that's much more positive and easier to engage with. So it's, it's the feed forward process. And what that does is it puts you in the driver's seat of your own feedback so that once you've identified what your development goals are, you go out to people and say, would you be prepared to give me some suggestions on what I need to do in order to meet my development goal? And people will give you suggestions. You make a decision about which of those suggestions you are going to put in place and let people know. Then in a month's time, you go to that person and this is where the feedback happens. So you've got this set up process. You're feeding forward so that you're in control of what you want to get out of feedback, what you want it to be about and when you're going to get it the big challenge I think for people um, and where uh, some of the people that I've worked with fall down a bit is remembering to go um, you know to people and say remember we set up this arrangement I ask you for some suggestions this is what I've been doing what have you seen but I think it's a great opportunity to take the sting out of feedback and to make it more positive. And in those teams and organisations that have taken it on board, you know, sometimes it's a little clunky to get started. It's a different way of, of engaging with each other. Um, they find that it's really quite powerful. Uh, one of the teams that I did with this with, what they did after a few rounds, a few months of asking for suggestions and then giving the feedback later, People felt really supported by each other. They, the, the term that they came up with was that we feel like, you know, everyone in the team has got each other's backs, you know, which made it a really safe process and, and did a lot around the team dynamics and making them more positive. Yeah, I, I think you're, you're, you're right in that, you know, that being able to have feedback as a part and feed forward as a part of, of what the team does is really really valuable and you talk about the feedback acceptance path in your book which uh, I personally found quite quite interesting because I think a lot of people don't necessarily take it well and then for those people that are givers they don't necessarily give it well so how, how can we use the feedback acceptance path to improve the way that we we give feedback as a coach mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think that we, we tend to, to lock ourselves out of giving feedback. We might have a bad experience of it or as a leader, you give feedback and nothing seems to change. Um, and so I think that my, my key message around the feedback acceptance path for leaders is that they shouldn't necessarily expect that people are going to love the feedback they give when they give it. Um, there are certainly better ways to give feedback um, and I also talk about, you know, constructive ways to give feedback so that you can reduce how much shock people feel when you give it to them um, and there's less chance that they'll deny um, that that's the case. But I think um, if leaders, sometimes, you, you know, you don't get a positive response to something so you don't try it again. You say, well, that didn't work. I need to do something else. Well, actually, maybe that didn't work. And rather than doing something else, you get better at doing this. And a part of getting better is understanding that, you know, when sometimes the things you do as a leader aren't going to be met immediately with acceptance. When leaders change their behaviour, you know, people might be a bit uh, suspicious uh, or concerned, you know, what's going on here? Um, why the change? All of a sudden, you weren't giving me feedback. Now you are. What's going on? Um, and, and so I think that there might be, um, if leaders start to do this more where they haven't been given much, uh, giving much feedback in the past, then what that means is that they can expect that there might be a bit of time until their people get to accepting either the process of being given feedback or specific pieces of feedback. So my hope is that after hearing this podcast, leaders are thinking to themselves, well, despite what's going on in other parts of my organization, I want to I try and build a coaching culture 
within my team. And if they're the CEO of a business, well, in their whole organization. But I want to look at it from the perspective of either organizational or as a team. How do leaders start trying, start trying to create a coaching culture? I think the first thing they've got to do is start coaching. So uh, there's some really interesting um, research that shows that there are quite significant improvements in business benefits when senior leaders coach and what they're doing is modelling that coaching style and culture for the rest of the organisation. So, you know, the place to start is to get coaching um, and to encourage other people to coach. And I think that one of the things that's really important as a part of that and leading to more of a, a culture of coaching, not just I do coaching, but I support everyone else to do coaching, is to be open to feedback yourself as a leader and to invite that so that people who are on the same level as you or people who are reporting to you are able to give you feedback and you demonstrate to them in that that you're coachable and that you're open to coaching, you're open to developing yourself, you know, you're not invulnerable um, and uh, you're not unchangeable. And so I think that kind of response from individual leaders can help set up um, more of a coaching culture. Uh, for, for senior leaders at the top of organisations, if they, they want uh, to have a, a coaching culture, then uh, they need to start talking about it as well as doing it and they need to be talking about what the value is of doing it and giving people some skills development so that they know how to do it. And I give a case example. It's a, a real example of an organisation, you know, a global mining company that you wouldn't necessarily expect to have a coaching culture and they they saw the whole idea of care as being foundational to the values that they had and caring was a, a, a really important part of how they wanted to be. Uh, and it wasn't about being, you know, touchy-feely or doing it just for the sake of it. They saw it as being really significant in creating a, a culture um, that was going to deliver business results. And so apart from the things that I've already talked about, what they also did was to, they made sure they were identifying leaders who weren't demonstrating coaching very well and they supported those leaders. They made it clear what their expectations were about how they engaged with their people. Uh, they had extra, uh, extra coaching. And, you know, w when their behaviour was too controlling, too commanding, um, that wasn't accepted. They were not allowed to get away with it. So they had a very strong focus around making sure that there was consistency um, in behaviour. So I think that there, there are a number of things that you can do if you're just an individual leader and you want more of a, a culture in your group. There are some things that you can do if you're at the top of the organisation and you want a culture throughout the organisation, then obviously there are many more leader levers that you have to play with. So if people want to find out more about you and the work that you're doing, Karen, where should they go? My website uh, contains all of that information and that's Karen Morley, K-A-R-E-N-M-O-R-L-E-Y dot com dot A-U. I'm also on LinkedIn um, and really happy to uh, connect with people who are interested in all things leadership and coaching. Now, I am going to do a shameless plug on your behalf and uh, suggest that uh, all my listeners need to go out and uh, buy this book because I think it's an invaluable toolkit. Any last words on leadership and coaching for the listeners? I think that while it might be a struggle to find the time to coach, I think that when leaders can make that shift they're not just going to get the, the good results, better results, um, and have people that they can delegate more work to, but they really are going to feel that weight lifted from their own shoulders, to feel leadership as less of a burden and, and to be much more invigorated and inspired by, by leading and to be leading in the way that they really desire to lead. So um, I encourage anybody who's listening to really step into coaching um, and to take whatever opportunities they can to coach more. Well, Karen, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Really appreciate it. Uh, all the best. Thank you very much, Julian. It's been a pleasure. 
Well, that wraps up episode 63 of the Synergen Leadership Podcast. Another great author interview episode for you. I'd like to encourage you to head on over to the Synergen Group website and engage in the conversation with us. Tell us what you liked about the episode. Tell us who you'd like us to interview or tell us what sort of content you'd like us to deliver. And as always, if you are an iPhone user, please feel free to head on over to the Apple site and leave us a review. It'd be greatly appreciated. In next week's episode, I speak with Mike Adams, who is the author of Seven Stories Every Salesperson Must Tell. It's another great author interview. And until then, love to hear what you think and keep on listening.